This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? I know for me, I hit a wall in June. The pandemic was causing a lot of stress for me and I knew that I needed to talk to someone. So I signed up for BetterHelp, (laughs) no joke. And it has been so helpful to have a professional to talk to virtually. Here's how it works. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating in under 48 hours. To be honest, taking the survey is <laughs> actually kind of fun. I don't know why. But after you're matched, you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. I personally switch back and forth between doing video sessions at my house and doing phone sessions while walking around my neighborhood. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit betterhelp.com good and join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. And BetterHelp is offering a special offer for Sounds Good listeners to get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash good. That's better H-E-L-P slash good. One more time, that is betterhelp.com slash good. This podcast is sponsored by Libro FM. Libro FM is the first and only company that lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 150,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. I have been using Libro FM for months now before they were even a sponsor, and I just finished listening to Barack Obama's thoughtful new book, as well as Samantha Irby's hilarious book, Wow, No Thank You. And for both purchases, my cute little bookstore, Broadway Books, was supported. With Libra FM, you get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there. <laughs> you know the name. But you'll be a part of a different story, one that supports community. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. Listen while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro FM app. As a special offer for Sounds Good listeners, get two audiobooks for the price of one, only $14.99, with your first month of membership with the code GOOD. All you have to do is visit the website Libro.fm, that's L-I-B-R-O dot F-M, and use the promo code GOOD to get started with two free audiobooks and to help support this show. This week's episode of Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is brought to you by the Gradient Podcast Network. Sounds Good is one of the launch shows of the Gradient Podcast Network. Check out the other podcasts like, in case you missed it, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's a podcast, and animalators at gradient.is. That's gradient.is. Hey everyone, Brandon Harvey here for another episode of Sounds Good. We're officially on episode two of the show. Thank you so much for all of your support last week. Your tweets, your shares, your reviews, they all meant a lot. So thank you. Today I'm talking with one of my longtime heroes, Jedediah Jenkins. Years ago, he played a huge role at Invisible Children in their legal department. More recently, he biked from Oregon to Patagonia, which is seriously crazy, ridiculous. And you've probably heard about him all over the internet because a lot of people have, and that's why he has 108,000 followers on Instagram. Jedediah currently lives in LA where he's writing his soon-to-be-released book about his many adventures. And all these things are amazing, but more than anything, I think Jedediah is a brilliant, articulate, fascinating human being. And I left our conversation inspired and ready to look at the world with more wonder and joy.
I am here with Jedediah Jenkins. Uh, Jedediah, just what did you do? You road tripped across the country to be here in Nashville, Tennessee, and you're sitting in front of me right now drinking a cup of coffee. Welcome. Thank you. I'm honored to be here and love my coffee. Let me just start off by saying that I think you're amazing. I think you're great. I think you're amazing. Well, thank you. But I have been following you on the internet for forever. Um, I remember back in the MySpace days. I was, no. I was aware of you. I Okay, this is embarrassing. I stalked you on MySpace today. I was like, I just want to make sure that Jedediah has a MySpace and that like I'm remembering this correctly. You liar. And I found your MySpace page today. What is on it? You've got a great picture. A lot of your posts are gone. I don't know how that works. But I scrolled through your friends, and we have a lot of mutual friends from 2008. So <laughs> I don't even – how did MySpace work? It Didn't was, you have, like, a song that you could post at the top? A song would post. It and was, it would, like, automatically play, which was annoying. Or it something. was great. Like, some, some MySpace pages were so loud. Yeah, but it was and like, But it was accepted. It Everybody knew that yeah. it was okay. But so, anyway, I followed you on MySpace. I remember following you on Tumblr, which is – Classic. I don't even think I have a Tumblr anymore. I am deep in Tumblr these days. Really? Deep. Okay. I, Tumblr and Vine are where all the best jokes begin. Yeah. All the memes. Absolutely. And so I'm deep. Good. Anyway. I fully respect that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I just think you're great. And you and I met, what, a few months ago on a train going across the country. But that's what's so remarkable about living in 2016 slash 15 is that I already knew you and I felt like I knew you so well, <laughs> you know, and then it's yeah. just like, it's like our physical bodies met and it was just like shaking hands and hugging. Although we probably didn't shake hands. We probably just hugged. But, I, I think so. <laughs> but it's so interesting how your brain and your voice and your perspective can be like rocketed into the world mm -hmm. apart from your physical existence and you can connect with people. I don't know. I think it's wonderful. Totally. And, I, and I think that that's something that you're uniquely great at because we didn't meet until after you got back from your incredible bike adventure, which we're going to talk lots about. But uh, <laughs> I had followed you through that whole process. And so I feel like I had almost been on that journey with you because you're an eloquent writer. You're, you're really great at bringing people into an experience. And so I don't know. That's really fun. <laughs> well, that was kind of my intention. So I, I rode my bicycle from... Yeah, or, let me just back up okay. and say, like, what the... Like, you you <laughs> you got on a bicycle and you it's biked from Oregon to Patagonia, which, in all fairness, you know, that's north to south. That's all downhill. That's exactly. easy. If you've it done Patagonia really to Oregon, that's hard stuff. Honestly, it, it psychologically <laughs> feels so much harder. <sighs> I know. But, like, so you did that. Like, yeah. What? <laughs> I wish you guys could see Brandon's face because it's so happy. <laughs> I just like <laughs> being across the table. Yes. So I, it was about 10,000 miles. I bicycled most of it, but not all of it because sometimes I had to like hitchhike through miserable desert or because there was only a freeway in Mexico City or whatever reason. So, but it was a 10,000 mile journey and it was just, it, it I did it to change my life and it succeeded. And it wasn't, you know, the same kind of way that most people go on these spirit quests where they're like trying to find themselves or they feel lost. I actually really had this dream inside me of being a writer, writing books. Um, but I felt inadequate and I felt too young. I mean, I'm 33 now. I was 30 when I started my bike trip. And that like right about when I turned 30, like when the like, timer on the oven goes ding and the cake's ready I finally felt like you know what I've lived a long I've lived long enough on this planet to have something to say I don't know everything I don't even know a lot but I know some things and I feel a duty to say that but I also didn't feel like anybody would care and so I was like maybe if I do something really weird people then I can just write about that thing and it'll train my writing to be good enough where people will care. And there's a quote about that, right? Who is it that said? Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. So it's a, it's a quote that is one of my favorites of all time. And he says, either write something worth reading or do something worth writing. And you did both. Yeah. Because you're a great writer and you're like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just throw in a bonus trip yeah. across the world. Yeah. And so it was really this like 
leap of faith into my dream of like, I want to be a writer. I'm going to write a book about this. Here we go. And so, you know, it was a 16 months journey and it was just, it was remarkable. And it was, it was so special to be, you know, when you're 30, you're an adult man and it, is just a beautiful thing to feel like a kid again. Where, I mean, honestly, like a kid where I don't speak Spanish. So when I cross into Mexico, specifically the deserts of Baja, and I'm thirsty and hungry and sweaty and dirty, and I have to like smile and sign language my way into a meal and a bathroom and a place to sleep, It you just feel, like I think a lot of people walk around like zombies. They feel totally uninspired they feel bored or oppressed by all these responsibilities and obligations and things and to just have your life streamlined and simplified into i need a place to sleep i need food i need to lay Mm -hmm. down my body is so exhausted i that's what's so amazing like when your body's exhausted you can sleep you can sleep on the hood of a semi truck in the (laughs) desert and you just are just like so happy because you're just I feel, I don't know. Sleep is so important. That's like a whole other conversation. But I never slept. I would sleep when the sun went down. I would sleep from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., 12 hours, and not even wake up once. Like, who does that? Like, babies. That's I was a baby. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. I, I became a baby. And, and that, kind of, that, that right there kind of reminds me of this idea of being almost being childlike and kind of seeing everything with fresh eyes reminds me of a conversation that you and I had basically about this idea that um, that as you get older, time moves more quickly, and and it's because of experiences. And get, mm-hmm. I, you explain it so much better. Can you explain that for me again? Yeah. So I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I pretend would, you are. Yeah. <laughs> I would also love for any science based listener to like actually email me and tell me what the truth is of this. But this CC is, me on that, please. Yeah, this is what I've observed, is that the human brain is excellent at observing patterns. So it's looking for repeating information so that it can trust it. So, you know, we now are not surprised by the sunrise because it happens every day. And so you don't really, you might notice it's beautiful, but you're not like, look at that burning ball of fire in the sky every day. And the brain actually does that on purpose because it's trying to determine what's safe and what's not safe. There was a great episode of, I think it was Invisibilia podcast about the importance of categories. And basically they said, categories are important because if every time you saw a sofa, like you can see a sofa that's green, purple, red, corduroy, denim, leather, and it doesn't freak you out. But if if each time it had a different factor and your brain had no idea what it was, you would walk into the room and scream and be like, what is that? Is it alive? Is it a monster? Is it going to eat me? But you know it's a sofa. It's safe. So your brain is doing that all the time. But when you're a kid, everything is so new because you just showed up on the planet that I believe that's why time seems to move so slowly because your brain is downloading. It is so amazed by everything. It is so alert, so awake that 24 hours is years. And I mean, I remember so distinctly being 10 years old, 11 years old, and it was summer break, and I thought summer would never end. Like, it was an eternity. And I thought fourth grade would never end. I remember uh, in fourth grade is when Jurassic Park came out, and I wasn't old enough to see a PG-13 movie. But I remember seeing the trailer and being like, I will see that movie. And it felt like my whole life planning to convince my parents to let me go. Like, it felt like my whole life. And all that to say, your brain is so awake as a child. But then as you get older, your pattern recognition software becomes more and more robust. You keep observing patterns of behavior of adults, patterns of behavior of school, patterns of behavior of how to succeed and make money and all these things. And then once you have those patterns down, your brain then files them in the back and kind of goes on autopilot, which your brain wants to do because you're, it's a lot of energy to think all the time. And your brain is just like, I don't want to be stressed, so I'm going to go on autopilot as much as I can. But the side effect of that is that time starts to fly by because you're not paying attention anymore. And you're not amazed by things because you're like, 
yeah, I know how that works. It's every day is the same, Monday, Tuesday, you know, where I'm just like, you know what? If I want to live a bazillion years on this planet or at least feel like it, then I got to keep surprising my brain. You have to break the routine. Yeah. I got to shake it up and I got to surprise it and I got to keep it on its toes because the brain works best when you exercise it. And so, and the brain is very similar to the body in the sense where when you're like lethargic and on your couch and eating French fries, you don't want to work out. But once you start working out, you get addicted to it. And my brain is addicted to new experiences. And, and I honestly feel like if you ask me, we, a friend of mine was talking to me about a memory that was before my bike trip, 2012, which is not that long ago. Four years is like not that long. I was like, I don't even know who I was in 2012. Like that was a thousand years ago. Because, I mean, I've gone on this bike trip. I've started writing a novel. These are all huge new things for me. And that's four years, you know? Like, I will be a billion by the time I'm 40. And so that's kind of the goal. It's fun. It's so cool to hear that that's your, like, perspective on things, that everything feels fresh and new. And, like, uh, it's been four years and it's been a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, I admired you before four years ago, before you went on this big thing that really defined a lot of your life. Mm -hmm. um, you you went to law school. Mm -hmm. You basically were one of like the big original members to some extent of uh, Invisible Children. Mm -hmm. um, you, Yeah, and that's, that's the like narrative that I think a lot of people want to put me in, but I'm not, which is he quit his boring desk job to go on an adventure. Like, my job in my 20s was not boring. Yeah. It, I mean, I was flying back and forth between Uganda and Congo and Washington, D.C. and New York, working on international justice, human rights, like, uh, swelling youth movements across the U.S. to, like, advocate for the rights yeah. of child soldiers and kids in Central East Africa. Like, that is... A much better description would probably be that you quit a job that you loved, something you were passionate mm -hmm. about, something that was new and fresh every day to do something different that was new and fresh every day. Is that right? Yeah. It, it was really, I quit a job that I loved to honor and respect the, the sense of calling and the itch of purpose that I knew I had inside me. It was this whole thing of, I know that this is a good job and that I enjoy it, but I, in my gut of gut of guts, want to write books. I feel a call to that and I don't know why. I didn't make it up. Writing is hard, but I just, and I thought, you know what? I love my job at Invisible Children so much. I could blink and be here at 50, loving every day. Don't get me wrong. But I would, I would be like, man, I never wrote a book. I never tried that. And, and why didn't I try it? Because I was scared and I was scared of being embarrassed. And so that was the whole impetus of, you know what? If I do this at 30, and I spend five years chasing this dream and it crashes and burns. Pfft, I'm 35. Like I can go back to what I was doing. I can do all kinds, you know, I feel very like privileged that I have access to amazing human beings. I got to go to law school. I got to go to undergrad. I like, I know that I can find a job and, and I know that I'm like disproportionately happy naturally. Like it's just like brain chemistry. And so it's like, if I ended up moving back to Nashville and mowing lawns in the summer and working at my original job as the guy who made drinks and popcorn at the movie theater, Hollywood 27. Come on. That's great. I, whatever I got to do, I just know that I'll be okay because I, I value working hard and I love people. And so I feel like I can make it, but I, if I don't try this really scary thing, then I'll regret it. Yeah. You needed to take that risk. Yeah. And I'm going to pause you right there. I want to talk in a little bit about your jump from this job you loved to this crazy adventure and what that was like and how you planned for that. But I also want to back up and be like, okay, you're you're talking about how happiness is in your genetics and you're talking about how uh, like all these crazy things you did. And, and so many of us don't live in that same way. Yeah. And so I want to back up like, what was your childhood like? Like, what are your parents like? I grew up here in Nashville um, until I was 18 or 19. Before and, Nashville was super cool, kind of cool. Well, I, I, I had no <laughs> idea. I was like on the farm catching soft shell turtles and crawdads and releasing them in the house. 
yeah, I, I had no idea what was going on except like playing in the woods and watching way too much TV, which was like, that's probably why I ended up in the woods because my mom would lock me outside. She was like, you have to go outside. You're and I'm done. like, no. And then I would come back with like 20 turtles and release them in the house to <laughs> punish her. <laughs> She's like, oh my God. Um, no, but I grew up with creative parents because they're both writers, um, travel writers. And my mom's writing a novel now and my dad's writing a new travel book. They divorced when I, before I can remember, but they were amazing, are amazing parents. I grew up blessed in the sense where they had non-traditional jobs um, and their life was very feast or famine. Like I remember being a kid, I felt uh, economically stable to some degree, but then my teenage years were like dirt poor. Like we never could fly in a plane. We had to go camping as like the best option. We never ate out. It was a big deal to go to Wendy's because they had a dollar menu. It was like and I'm, I'm very grateful for that because now my, like, baseline for happiness is very low. Like, I don't need nice things to feel that sense of safety because my parents did a very good job of creating a sense of belonging and safety on a pretty low baseline of, like, survival. Um, but I, I did feel very uh, loved and affirmed early on. Um, there, there's some psychology behind between the ages of like zero and 12. Those are such important formative years on how you see the world because your brain is realizing how do I feel loved? How do I feel safe? And um, how do I control how other people respond to me? And so like those like factors are formed by the time you're 12. And so if you live in a volatile place where you don't feel love, from your parents, from friends, from teachers, then you try to compensate with other things. And those building blocks really affect the rest of your life. Um, and so for me, I think that I was, I was really loved. I was a weird kid, not good at sports, effeminate, strange in the South. But you know what? My parents never like, I never felt a look in their eye of like, wow, we didn't get Johnny high school. Bummer. Never. They were just like, you're amazing. You're so wacky and silly and doing accents and playing in the mud. They like, never pushed you to be something else. You yeah. just got to kind of be. You know, and it's not something that I was aware of at the time. I just knew I felt safe. And secure. Yeah. And, I, and that really has colored the rest of my life because I do feel really comfortable in my skin. And, I'm, and I think that is the best gift you can give a kid. And so with that confidence, I moved into high school. And I mean, I was 40 pounds overweight. I looked like a pepperoni pizza, acne so bad. I mean, I had a kid one time. He was just like, you know, like kids just say the craziest things. I was like a junior or a sophomore in college. And this like scrawny little freshman just walked up to me and cocked his head like an owl and looked at me. And he's like, you have really bad acne. And I didn't even know this kid. And I'm like standing there getting a soda and I'm like, I know. And he goes, you should go to a dermatologist. And I go, I can't afford it. And then he walked away and I was like, and it was one of those things where I was like, wow, even the random freshmen look at me like a monster. Crazy. But apart from that, like I still knew that if I could make people laugh and I was nice to them, people wouldn't reject me. And... I was just like a funny, silly, chubby kid with bad skin. But I, I didn't, I don't know. I was just happy somehow. And then, like, and I, I made friends easily because I was just friendly to them, you know? Yeah. And, you know, kind of grew out of my chubby phase when I started exercising. Because I, I remember there was a point where I couldn't see my feet. And I was like, I don't think this is, like, the best way to be. So I'm going to try, like, not eating an entire gallon of Rocky Road ice cream every day, you know, which was true. And that, do you feel like at that point you almost kind of set yourself on a trajectory of, of intentionality in some ways? Because I feel like your life seems very intentional to me where you go, I am going to do this thing. Yeah. Was there... Was that That's a good point. You know what? I think the intentionality actually happened at an exact moment in seventh grade. I changed schools from public to private school, this like little Christian private school in Nashville. 
in seventh grade. And on like day two, this kid made fun of me for being like effeminate. And he said something really mean to me in the hall that I can't even remember now, but I remember him walking past me and I'm standing alone in the hall. It's like one of those like vortex moments in a movie where the kid like has an inner dialogue. And I remember thinking, I can either hate him and be mean. I can be a, one of those mean people that's just like hates everybody and like cuts him down. Or I can be nice and make him realize that he shouldn't be mean to me because I could be his friend. Like there's no reason mm. to dislike me. I, re- I literally stood there at a crossroads in the hallway. I remember the blue carpet and the lockers and the like lights above. I just like stand there. And I thought, and it wasn't even a moral question. It was like animal. And I remember sitting there and I was like, being mean requires so much energy. Being nice is easier. I'm going to be a nice person. At, like in that moment, I was like intentional about like, this is the type of person I'm going to be. Yeah. And it changed my life. And it, yeah, it, it set you on a trajectory from yeah. there on out. It and was so a then I chose and I've been choosing ever since that's, how I want to be. That's so interesting. And that's one of the things that I'm really excited about with this show is this idea of kind of exploring like, who are these people who are nice and optimistic and are impacting the world and are people are looking at the things that they're doing and they they feel changed and it is not that people like do it by accident. And earlier Mm -hmm. you said like, you know, I'm genetically happy. And while that may be true, like (laughs) the truth is you also are by choice. happy. Right. Well, yeah. I just think that it's an easier way to be. Yeah. Like you can fight. Like I believe that God, the universe, whatever you see, there is a pattern there and it's, it is an organized pattern and it asks us, it says, Will you observe me and will you stand in awe at this amazing thing of being alive? Or will you fight against it because you think you're in control? Like, make your choice. Either enjoy this ride because you're not in control or fight me and I will win. 100% of the time, I will win. That's what the universe says. And to me, I'm like, I am going to enjoy this. I am going to look to things and I'm going to say, what are you going to teach me today? What's going on? How can I learn to better fit? Like if I'm in a giant flowing river, either I can try to swim upstream and ultimately drown from tiredness, or I can collect this driftwood, build a raft and sunbathe and love it and meet the other sunbathers and make my way to the ocean. How fun. That, that's exactly how I see life. And it's changed everything because now anything that happens, I'm either like, ooh, this is a challenge. Like, but but I'm still flowing in the right direction, you know? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so it just is like such a paradigm shift. I just want to fast forward a tiny bit. You go to law school, which is, why did you, why did you decide to go to, like I never considered going to law school. Me neither. I wanted to go to law school because I studied creative writing and film in undergrad. And I've always been really right-brained, like creative, like wacky. <laughs> and I felt... You know, there's that moment when you study like artsy things in college where you're like, "Uh uh-oh, I don't know how to do anything real. This is a problem. And then my dad suggested, he's like, you should go to law school. You're really good at like arguing with me. (laughs) I'm like, thanks, dad. And you should consider it. I think you'd be excellent at it. And it would be an amazing tool in your tool belt if you could do well on the LSAT and get some financial aid, you know? And I was like... Dad, ugh, I'm not going to law school. That's so basic. Or I was like so hateful towards it. Then, as the universe works, my best friend Jason Russell went to Sudan, then northern Uganda, and made a short film, made a film with his two friends called Invisible Children, The Rough Cut. And he asked me to watch it, and I was like, I don't know about the whole Africa thing. That feels overwhelming. Who wants to watch this? Not me. But I ended up watching it. And... It impacted me deeply. And young Jacob, the escaped child soldier, said, he asked Jacob, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I mean, this is like a kid from nothing in a war zone in northern Uganda. And he said, I want to be a lawyer because then I could help bring justice to my community. And this is like right after I had had this conversation with my dad where I was just like, ugh, dad. And all of a sudden, like my privilege 
hit me in the face where I was like, I can just go to law school when I want. I can just become a lawyer. And, and when that option is given to me, I roll my eyes and I'm annoyed. Like, how disgusting. And I was like, I should respect this opportunity and respond to it as a tool to make the world a better place. I should use it to give back. So, and I could like my, I'm so right brain. What if I exercise the left side of my brain and I become this like balanced human that is actually like a force of nature for good. That's what I'm going to do. So that's why I went to law school. I went to Pepperdine because I've, I've been a big fan of CS Lewis since I was younger and his reasoning abilities and the way that he took, you know, he was like, a dean at Oxford, so he was so he took education so seriously, and law school you have to because it's so intense. I, it just felt so important, and it really rewired my brain to see things like that, which I love. And that's I I, I started my work at Invisible Children as an attorney for them. I love the intentionality behind that and the idea of being like I'm going to be a force for good, um, and I'm going to do that through this thing that I'm privileged enough to be able to do. Yeah. And you go on to Invisible Children and you you do kind of some law stuff for them, but you're mm-hmm. also using your writing yeah, it and happens. communication skills. Well, and that's, that's a, a thing where I don't know about the whole conversation to find your passion and follow your dreams because like, I believe in that. I really do. But I think a lot of people feel guilt because they're like, well, I don't know what my passion is. Like, what, what, do you, what am I supposed to do now? And for me, I didn't know I, I, my passion was writing. I didn't know that. I just kind of observed that I was okay, at, pretty good at articulating things. We would be in meetings at Invisible Children. We were trying to put together the voiceover for a documentary to try to explain this complex issue. And they would say, Jed, how would you say it? And I'd say it, and they'd go, oh, my God, write that down. That's it. And that, so I had it affirmed in me. People kind of spoke it over you. Yeah, it was what I was naturally doing. And they spoke it over me. So then they started like making me write more. And then I realized I loved it. And then I read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. And he has the whole topic about the 10,000 hour rule, which you know is not necessarily exact science, but this idea that if you do something for 10,000 hours, you become an expert. And as happens with me, Benjamin Franklin quotes like Rock My World. And I don't even know if this is true, but it doesn't matter. And he said, uh, there, there's the quote, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. And I read somewhere, maybe it was Mark Twain, who knows who said it. But I read somewhere that that's a misquote, that it's actually, I'm a jack of all trades, master of one. Hmm. Where it's like, I master one thing, but I can do a little bit of everything. Which I love because I think mastery gives you such a beautiful language of analogy for everything else. If you are an expert at making furniture, then when you speak and you talk about the patience of bending wood and using steam and like the craftsmanship and this and that, that gives you a language for understanding all types of other mastery. And it focuses you and you can just, I just, I love the idea. And so I remember feeling, and the theme of intentionality, thinking of my life, And being like, what on earth would I spend 10,000 hours doing? Like, what? And I realized that my favorite feeling in the world is when I'm reading a book and and I underline a passage. In the world, if I'm reading something, and it happens most with like John Steinbeck and Henry Miller, um, and I read something and I'm like, oh my God, they said it. That's exactly what I believe. I didn't know I believed it until right now. Somehow they've been in my brain and they said it before my brain even got there. Bam. And I underline it. And I was like, that's what I want to bring to the world. I want to spend 10,000 hours doing that. And that was kind of what clicked me over to like moving away from law, hiring a new, an amazing new attorney at Invisible Children so that I could do full-time writing. Then I kind of like planted the seed of, okay, I need to do this. Like, this is what I'm here to do. So in three years, when I turn 30, I'm going to quit this job. And you gave like a three-year notice. Is that right? Yeah, which is so weird. But but like, I don't know like how old the, any of these listeners are, like what, y'all, how, what y'all's ages are. I'm sure it's a whole range. But if you're under 30, you probably think 30 is like intimidating. You're like, that is an adult. Like, whoa. And, and so that's how I felt. I was 27 when like all this was going down and I was like, okay, 30 is coming. 
I need to be like a mature man. But I also don't want to be someone I don't want to be, you know. And so I'm just going to use 30 as like a, a re- not a reset button because I think every day up until then was so important and formative and I wouldn't trade it for the world. But it's just a moment for intentionality. And I think I kind of want to do that with each decade, 30, 40, 50. I want to like do something big and strange each one. Um, because this one was, you know, you're only a few years past 30 and this was so defining for you. Oh, yeah. And if you can do that every decade, oh, yeah. you know, you will be a billion. I know. I already feel like at least 800 million. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, I don't know. I just feel so, it kind of goes back to what we we're talking about with childhood. I just feel so blessed that I see the world and life experience as my friend because and I don't fight it. I'm not a fighter. I just, I'm not good at that's why I'm not good at sports because like I'm a, I'm not competitive. I I don't have that in me to like win. I just and that might be a flaw. I don't know. Like if you want me on your team, pick me last and just like put me on the bench. I'm but I'm a great encourager, but I'm not I'm just not a fighter because I just think everything is so beautiful and such a lesson. But what's so funny is that because I value hard work and I also value this call towards being the best person I can be and, and, and living with intention, I end up working really hard and doing a lot of big things which feel like I'm fighting for something and fighting a dream and being brave from the outside. But on the inside, it doesn't feel brave. Hmm. It's just like, oh, fun, let's try this. Okay, and, and that, that kind of gets me wondering. So you, you set out on this journey to bike from Oregon to Patagonia. And I think a lot of people listening would probably be like, that sounds scary. Mm-hmm. Were you scared going into that? Is How does fear play into this idea of, of fighting? Mm, I am not a fearful person. I just, and it's a problem. It's a problem. I mean, you could, I just, I'm so optimistic. And I just believe people are innately good. And I think, bad people are damaged from lack of love and so I just empathize with that and I like my whole bike trip I experienced cartels I experienced drug dealers I experienced trespassing angry ranchers this and that and they were all ultimately so kind to me because I was kind to them and I know that that's not necessarily everyone's story I mean I know that there are like people who have just for no reason or no observable reason, been murdered, you know? And I, that is horrible, and that just shows the brokenness of people and the brokenness of the world. But for whatever reason, I'm alive, and in all my travels, I've just had excellent experiences. And I don't really get scared. I don't, I I try to not be dumb, you know? Like, I don't, like, walk into a volcano that's erupting. Like, no. But I do, I try to trust... I try to trust local voices instead of regional isolationism because that's what happens. Like when you live in Franklin, Tennessee, and you're like, I'm not going to Mexico. They behead people down there. You know, it's like, well, I live in San Diego. I lived in San Diego at the time. And like all my friends who live in Tijuana and and Sonata are like, it's awesome down here. Don't like, don't be afraid. Like if you're not trafficking cocaine, you're probably fine. And they were right. So I just, I just choose to trust locals, you know? And if, and if a local says, I wouldn't come right now, then I'm like, okay, I believe you. But if they say, come on, don't listen to that. I just think that people can be fearful when they're far away. And I do not live like that. That's that's a great quote. People can be fearful when they're far away. Mm-hmm. I feel like that is probably a metaphor for our political season. It's a metaphor yeah. for why people don't travel internationally. It's mm-hmm. a metaphor for... Why people, you know, don't take risks in their own life. Well, I, you know, what's interesting is I've very rarely, maybe never met a traveler who's closed minded. Hmm. If you meet someone who travels the world, it is much more difficult to have a provincial, hateful, small view of the world and to think that the truth is this tiny little nugget that you happen to have found in your small town if you've seen the world. 
if you have met people from all over who have different walks of life and you engage with them and you share wine with them or a coffee and you hear their story, it is much more difficult to be bigoted, angry, and fearful. And so that's why I'm such an advocate of travel. If you mm -hmm. can, just go. It's, I have friends from New York and Los Angeles who are like, I would never go to the South. It's so backwards and disgusting. And I'm like, you don't know how awesome it is. And you don't know how beautiful it is. And the weight of the history here creates such potent human beings. It creates civil rights activists. It creates, it just is so alive that, you know, and, and if you sit in judgment from afar and you think that, that you don't have racism in Los Angeles, one of the most segregated cities I've ever seen, you know, it's like, it's just interesting. And, and so I'm just like, you got to get out. You got to go see. And then if you have an opinion about a different people or a different place, I'll listen to you if you've been there and you've talked to them. If you haven't, I'm not interested. <laughs> and man, I, I love the way that you see the world. This is so interesting. Um, and I agree with you on like so much of this. That's been so much of my experience with travel. And I grew up in a small little town in Washington and I was just kind of processing through because I actually, in my small little town in Washington, I actually don't feel like Though it was a small town, I had a super closed-minded community. And I was kind of thinking through that. I think it's because we had a university in our town. Mm. And so though most people, not I don't know, I don't want to say most people, but a lot of people don't travel all over the place. Most people aren't experiencing all these different cultures. There's other cultures traveling to them. And it kind of... I feel mm -hmm. like that that's the powerful thing about the internet. That's the powerful thing about right. this world that we live in is we have the opportunity to hear all of these voices and to be changed and moved by them for no dollars. Well, and that's, I think, the number one access point and key to a lifetime of learning, of open-mindedness, of joy, of friendship with the world is cultivating curiosity. What I love about the word curiosity is that it doesn't come with it a moral judgment of approval or disgust. If you're curious about something, it means you just want to know more. And that's how I am. You know, it's like, take me to a brothel, take me to a mega church, take me to a mosque, take me to Hong Kong. Like, I'm curious. I don't know anything about that. I want to know, mm -hmm. you know, and... And you can and travel really exercises the curiosity in your brain when you walk down the cobblestone streets in Spain, Barcelona, and you're like, oh, I did, this is so beautiful. Like, but that what's so great about curiosity is you don't if you have curiosity, you don't have to travel. You can sit in the public library on Google and be like, you know what? I've heard of Napa Valley, and I don't even know what that is. You Google it. You read about it. All of a sudden, you've been there. In a small way, you've been there. And that's what I find so wonderful about curiosity is that you can become the most interesting conversationalist, the wittiest, the most fascinating human being just by cultivating curiosity in your house, in your daily life. It's something that I have started to do and... And I'll say this since this is early in the episodes, but this is not like a Christian podcast, like whatever you believe, like this podcast is for you. Uh, but one thing that I pray for more consistently than almost anything else is for genuine curiosity, mm -hmm. that God would give me a genuine sense of curiosity, because I think that allows me to see people, see my neighbors as people worth loving. You know, you were talking yeah. about this earlier. There's these bad people in the world, but they're not bad because they're bad. They're bad because something happened to them. And you can also find the good in them. And you can go to these bad places, but there's also the good in those places. And there's these mm -hmm. bad ideas, but there's also the good in those ideas. What I love about the quest for understanding is that no matter who it is, if they're a human being, they have a story and they have a reason. It might even be a brain defect, but if they're murdering people, if they're espousing hate, they come from somewhere, you know? And if you can pity them, if you can understand them, um, then you can see what they're seeing because what they're doing is dehumanizing you. So if you dehumanize them, 
you might be on the right side of history, but you're using the same tools they are. You're perpetuating the cycle. Yeah. And I would imagine this is something you guys ran into at Invisible Children, where you're basically fighting Joseph Coney, Mm -hmm. who's a terrible warlord. But like, you guys don't, like, what's your perspective on Joseph Coney? Right. Because you have to humanize him in a way that, I don't know. Well, that, that, that was a really tricky thing working at Invisible Children is because we did dehumanize him to a degree because our goal was to create massive support. Yeah. A international support to know that this guy is like Osama bin Laden level bad. People did not know that he existed until right. Invisible Children really came around. Like, uh, Yeah, the global community didn't know. Yeah. Um, Teenagers like myself at the time <laughs> had right. no clue. And that messaging made us care. Right. But and then there so, was a level of yeah, and humanizing. So, and then you need to humanize because that is, he is a human being who's, you know, if he had experienced, I believe, a certain level of love as a child, he wouldn't be who he was, you know, who he became. Mm-hmm. And the goal was always for him to be brought to justice, not to be taken right. out. exactly. And it still is. Oh, exactly. Oh, we want to, like, our dream is to see him on trial at The Hague before the International Criminal Court. Um, the day Fatou Ben Souda, who's the uh, chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, the day that she's like bringing, like <laughs> talking to him on the stand, I'll just like weep because like what a win for international justice. But um, but like that whole quest for understanding and curiosity, I think is so important. But also understanding that looking for the source. If your cultivation of curiosity is actually to make you feel like you can win arguments, that you can gossip better than you, that you are more powerful, you need to like question your motives there. Like for me, my curiosity is to understand the world and to, and through understanding the world to better fit in. You know, this is my one and only life, I think, and I want my time on this earth to be positive. You know to be a positive experience. And so I want to be a student. What's what's so interesting about being alive is you wake up with this brain, this capacity for reason, for observation, six senses. And I think our first and foremost duty is to be like, okay, I need to figure out what's going on and then do my best to fit in. And and fit in in the sense of like play by the rules of the universe. Because if I play by the rules, it becomes a game and I love it. If I don't, I'm confused. And I think, and then you go back to where you're fighting the universe, and you're fighting the experiences right. around. Right, and that's you. what's so funny is I think the whole 85 years, if we're lucky, 100 years on this planet are learning. You know, like maybe when I'm 80, I'll sit back with a cigar on a porch and be like, "Nailed it!" You know, that's the dream. Nailed it. But I'll up until then, I'm going to be listening with my ear to the ground and my eyes to the sky, looking for clues on how this whole phenomenon of being alive works and how to promote how to grease the gears and make it a beautiful experience because i honestly think god the universe wants us to do that he's like i am speaking to the universe constantly about how it works everything is testifying to what's going on so listen just listen and when you think you've got a clue, talk to people about it. And that's literally why I'm here. <laughs> that's why you're here. Yeah, is to like to talk about those clues and then get clues from other people, which and, is why I love reading. And through that, you're inspiring curiosity in other people. You're helping people break out of their little box. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that your growth online during your whole journey your Oregon to Patagonia journey, you gain tens of thousands of followers. I think that's a little bit of a testament to that, that people were inspired. Well, one of the best, like, um, it's been said many times, I think Toni Morrison said it most famously, where she was like, write the book you want to read. Tell the story you want to hear. And for me, uh, I want to write stories, and I want to say things that, man, if I was 22, I wish someone would have said this. If I was 27 again, you know, I needed to hear this. So I'm going to say it now because maybe someone is 22 and they're like, oh my gosh, literally me. Like, whoa, that's my my favorite thing <laughs> on Instagram is when someone like at mentions their friend and goes, oh my gosh, us. Oh my gosh, me, <laughs> me, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, yes, I'm not alone on this planet. Yeah. Neither are you. That's when you're doing it right. Yeah. 
And so you've shared so much of your story online. Mm-hmm. Now you're putting that into book form. Mm-hmm. And and you probably don't, you don't really get that same affirmation because you're not posting everything you do. But you've almost kind of tested stuff out like Oh yeah. What is what is writing like right now? Like is it are you having fun? Is it hard? What like what is it like? It is I imagine you just sitting in coffee shops yeah, in Los Angeles. Exactly. Is that accurate? That's exactly it. Perfect. Um, I go, my, my routine as of this year, I kind of floundered a little bit last year, just puking out all the stories and the things and kind of like figuring out what kind of book I want to write. It's a, it's a autobiographical novel about my bike trip, meaning Hmm. it's fictionalized. I've taken like a bazillion liberties, but I'm telling the truth as I've seen it with the liberty and through the liberty of fiction, because sometimes you can say more by not using real names, mixing around characters, changing traits, where you don't have to worry about stepping on anybody's toes. You're just like, this is all made up, but wink, wink. It's not. It's true of the human experience. Mm-hmm. It's just no one is individually being indicted. Not that I indict anyone because I think everything is teaching me something. So I'm like, I like love everything, <laughs> even the hard stuff. Um, so I'm just like working on like, so, so last year was really just figuring all that out. And this year I realized I am like a classic level 10 internet addicted millennial. And so what I found is that I, the dopamine boost that comes from checking my email, checking Instagram, texting people, planning lunch, planning dinner, whatever the heck, is fully stifling my creative productivity. So simple rule from 9 a.m. until 12 every morning which is when my brain works best, which is like right now when we're recording this. I leave my phone in the car. I go to one of like five coffee shops I know of that do not have Wi-Fi. And I sit there for three hours with my coffee and I write. And there's, oh, I start by reading like a New Yorker or a Harper's article, like a long article. It gets my juices flowing. It familiarizes me again with beautiful writing. Then I close it my brain stimulated and I work for two and a half hours. And it's amazing. Like there it's amazing how much work you can get done in that short amount of time. Like we think when we go to the office and work for nine hours or eight hours in the office or whatever, you're getting a lot done. But if you think about it, how much of that time are you actually focusing, doing something? Totally. You're in meetings. You're like, why am I in this meeting? Oh my God, another meeting. And then you're like checking your email. Then you're on Facebook. And then you're like, tabbing over to your email when your boss walks by because you're actually on Facebook or whatever you're doing. It's that whole thing. And it's like, you're like, if you got even 90 minutes of focus productivity down a day, you would build a skyscraper. And that's like, so for me, two and a half hours and of that, you know, probably half an hour of it, I'm like looking at the tile being like (laughs) zoning and wonder, you know, but I get beautiful work done. So that's, and I'm just, Writing, connecting the dots, writing these scenes, having so much fun, processing. The book is very, very vulnerable and raw, like to a fault. It's going to be an intense ride and very, it's just about spirituality and the self-discovery and liberty and sexuality and travel and international politics and just all these interesting things. That and all these things that... I've always been fascinated by because of you, too. Well, thank you. I feel like we've had great conversations about all of those topics. Yeah, well, that's and that's the thing is like you write what you know, and I I write best. When I write about something that's interesting to me, it flows out. If you ask me to write about football formations and like which ones are more successful and I had to do the research, I'm a curious person, so I could do it, but it wouldn't flow. Mm -hmm. but you know if you want to talk about the formation video Beyonce I can write a dissertation I would love that you know I'm all in on that Jeremy that's this is great swag hot sauce in my bag (laughs) (laughs) when does the uh, when is the book gonna come out what's your game plan I don't the game plan is uh, there is no game plan except I'm hoping to be done with my like first draft by end of May and then uh, sign with a publisher, be paired with an editor, 
and then the editor will become my boss because I'm a very right-brained individual and I'm like a splatter of paint and I need somebody with a paintbrush to like make me beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so I need an editor. And so from that point on, it'll be a polishing process. And I don't know if that's going to be six months, one month or a year. I would love for the book to come out this Christmas, but it might not be till next summer. I don't, I don't really understand a lot of the like it's weird business. Yeah. I'm, I'm not so worried excited. about that right now. Yeah. I'm so excited for that though. And that's what's fun about Instagram is that what's so, ugh, it's just such an honor and such a privilege to be able to like write little things and have anybody care at all. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't believe it. What, just to, just to be in a place where somebody cares. I, there, the Oprah has this amazing quote where she says, everyone in the world is asking three questions. Do you hear me? Do you see me? And does what I say mean anything to you? She's like, everyone's the same. And if you approach people in that way, they're asking, when you meet somebody, even if it's the toll booth guy, if it's a barista, if it's your mom, they are always saying in their interactions with you, do you hear me? Do you see me? And does what I say mean anything to you? And so I try to live in that posture because I'm like, and, and I live in the gratitude when someone does hear, see me and, and imply or say that what I say matters to them. I feel like I am not a waste of space. I am here to help somebody feel understood to just love life more. And I, you know what? I am not like a self-help person. I don't even know what's going on, but I just know that I love writing things. I love expressing my life through words. And it's just such a joy to know that anybody cares. <laughs> I'd do it if they didn't, but I'm glad they do. I love that. <laughs> uh, this is this is so fun. This is such a fun conversation <laughs> with know. you. I'm just You're like soaking it up. Uh, <laughs> I want to transition from here to, I've got a, a few last questions that I love to ask every single person I meet. Cool. Um, the first one is, how would you describe the kind of person you most admire in the world? People who have egoless self-confidence. So I think personality that is um, manipulated by insecurity is toxic. And so when someone is trying to be your friend, but they're actually trying to social climb and being validated by your validation or these things when they don't love out of abundance, but out of lack, trying to find value in themselves because they do not value themselves. That to me is very, and so many people operate like that and bless their hearts. Bless. Like that is everyone's dealing, you know, everyone's insecure, but some people more than others are fully like manifest that as their identity and they don't even know necessarily. But And so I find myself so drawn to people who love out of abundance. And, and that abundance comes from the knowledge that they are lovable. Because once you know you're worthy of love, you no longer feel the feverish necessity to capture it and hold on to it like a baby. Like you, you have your hands wide open and you're like, I know that I'm okay. And so then when I love you, it's not, I don't need anything from you. I just love you. I just love being here. And, and those people are so life-giving because, I mean, we've all experienced it where somebody wants something from you. And so they're extra nice or, or, or something because they want, and when that's transparent, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. But then you notice when someone has no business, they are, they're busy about their own life and doing their thing. And then they show you love they pay attention, they listen, they sit with you. And you're just like, wow. And you know, and in a, it's a, it is a true beautiful exchange because you see the joy on their face of just the engaging with another human. And so those types of people who love out of abundance, when they, they have egoless self-confidence, they, they fully know that they're okay. And because of that, they can love with no strings attached. Those are the people I try to seek out and I believe you're one of those people. And I really am just impacted. And you feel it's so powerful to be in the presence of someone like that. Well, that's that's really nice. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
I was going to say the same thing about you, which is now it's now it's just cute because we both said it about each other. <laughs> but but that's something, and and I wanted to talk to you about this because it's it's been very interesting to watch you through the internet and through also the cool thing about the internet is I see you through other people's lenses. So I'll see somebody on Instagram post about you, not you posting about them or you posting about yourself. It's them sharing about you, um, and you are uh, friends with. You like you call world leaders friends, different like <laughs> like big name celebrities. Like you were just at some sort of like celebrity party or something, and I just like saw a tagged <laughs> photo on Facebook, and I'm like, "What is Jedediah doing with like?" I don't I don't even remember. It was like some actor, and and I know that you would never say this about yourself, but I think I think that the reason that you have those sort of relationships that a lot of people would be like, "Oh my gosh, I want that sort of relationship," is that you see these people as the exact same way that you would see a cartel leader in Mexico or mm-hmm. you you just look at people and and you know that like you have the opportunity to love them and that you are worth loving and that you know what I, this this bears a uh, conversation because it's interesting i i live in los angeles half the year and then i try to live in nashville even more um but there's a lot of celebrities out there and I have found because of my insatiable curiosity and because I am a very self-confident person, I don't really care about someone's status. If they are special to me and interesting, then they get my time. And what's so interesting is that our culture, which values fame and wealth so much, not just our culture, most cultures, Western cultures particularly, value that to such a disproportionate degree that some of the loneliest people I've ever met are the rich and famous. Because what people forget is that one of the most primal desires of a human being is a sense of belonging. And if you have something that makes you quote-unquote extraordinary, then the average Joe no longer feels kin to you. And therefore, instead of looking at you with affection... They look at you with different eyes, with alien adoration. And that is very strange. And so these amazing like actors and tech people that I know who have experienced extraordinary success, we actually become such good friends because, and I don't even try, I don't seek it, but they see in me this like safe curiosity that doesn't give two craps about what their job is. I'm just fascinated by the circumstance of their life. Mm Mm-hmm. And I listen and, you know, we just have the most rich conversations and I see the humanity in them, especially these, especially what's so interesting is if you experience fame at a young age where you never really were allowed to develop a strong sense of people value me for my personality, for my energy, for who I am. If you're famous at 13 or whatever, then, I mean, I've had these conversations with good friends of mine where they're like, I cannot meet a new person without fear because I meet them. And if they're laughing at my jokes, I wonder, are they laughing because they like me or are they laughing because they know who I am? What a curse. Like I feel so privileged that when I meet somebody and they enjoy my presence, that they don't have two clues who I am. And so they obscurity really is a gift in that way. It's a gift. It is a privilege. It's weird. It's a thing that you don't know you need until it's gone, Mm -hmm. you know, and and how absurd to say that like it's, but it just, if you don't have it, you could have all the money in the world, but you're trapped in your castle. And it's like the fact that you and I can walk to Kroger and not be bothered. I mean, Obviously, these are champagne problems, but this is the thing is that because we disregard the problems of the rich and famous, they feel even more isolated because money cannot solve your problem. It solves some problems like you don't, but it buys you new ones. And if you don't feel a sense of belonging and friendship with other human beings, you're miserable. You're miserable. And so I, I just... It's just an interesting world to be in in Los Angeles. And I really enjoy, I see value in the grounding of just being a, a good friend to people, you know? And, and, and that's the thing is I'm self-confident. I know when someone's my friend, I'm like, you're lucky. I'm awesome. <laughs> I will love you. 
I will listen to you. We will have good times. I know that, you know, I'm not like, I just feel like so lucky and honored that, that people are interested in receiving what I want to give, you know, that's great. Let's hang, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's great. It's just an interesting conversation because I do hang out with some weird people, you know? Yeah. And that's, it's not weird to me anymore because I've yeah. you know lived in LA for 15 years, but it is weird to a lot of people. And mm-hmm. it's once you're inside there and you realize that everyone's a human being. Yeah, they're just people. Yeah. Everyone's a human. Yeah. And that's that's something cool about this podcast is that I want to just have conversations with a lot of these people that we see of as as more than people and just be like, okay, let's get down to the basics of like yeah. of like what makes you hopeful and like what scares you mm-hmm. and like where do you find happiness within that balance between those two things? Yeah. It's going to be interesting. This is such an important podcast. That means a lot, man. It is. I just think the pursuit of joy is such a valuable thing. Because when we pursue, I I mean, going to law school was so eye-opening to me because people think that money solves your problems. And there is like an observable threshold. Like money makes you happier up to $80,000. It's like actually Mm -hmm. like I read that study. Yeah. And then after that, you plateau. Fully. It's not that you necessarily dip for a while. You plateau and then... Yeah, if you get too much, it's like, I think Henry David Thoreau said, like, I don't want so many possessions because then my job becomes managing my possessions. Mm -hmm. And this happens with these wealthy people. And so, like, I do believe money solves all. If you are destitute, if you are living paycheck to paycheck and you can't feed your family, whatever, it's like, hello, duh. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You need your food, your shelter, your safety before you can know that you are worth something before you can Mm -hmm. start pursuing new things. But what I saw is that some people overcompensated in law school. Maybe they grew up lower middle class. You know, their money was a struggle. So they were like, I'm going to go to law school and I'm going to be freaking rich. and I'm not going to have these problems anymore. But they don't realize they're trading joy and life for this money. They're literally selling their mm-hmm. soul to fill this hole in their life that was built when they were 11 years old, thinking that money was the answer because their parents were always stressed. And so they're answering a question they asked when they were 11 and they didn't even think to ask it again when they're 25 because it's so deep inside them and their subconscious. And that's what I want to do is like, I want to ask the questions, the why behind the why and figure out what do I really want? You know, what can my skills best do to serve me and serve others? The things that I think so often, and I found myself even like prioritizing are not real priorities. And that's what sucks is that we don't realize they're empty promises until we get them and then we get them and then they're not. This is what's so fascinating. Jim Carrey has a quote. He goes, I wish everyone could be rich and famous so that they would see that it answers nothing. And that's the thing. All these unhappy celebrities who get divorced, commit suicide, whatever. And then America's like, ugh, what a loser. And it's like, we all think, oh, well, if we got rich, we would do it right. You know, and it's like, you probably wouldn't, you know, maybe if you got 80,000 bucks, you'd do it right. But 85,000, 100 million, I don't know. That's what's so funny is Steinbeck has a quote in Travels with Charlie. It's it's a little bit changed, but um, it's basically like America is populated with temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Hmm. That's Isn't that great? So it's like, we're all like, oh, I should be rich. Like, I deserve to be rich, but I'm not right now. But, you know, when my ship comes in, it's this whole idea. And I'm just like, yes, that is so us, which has a flip side because we all feel like we're allowed to dream big, which I love. Mm -hmm. But we also sometimes dream about uh, things that will not serve us. It's interesting. (laughs) I want to trade. I I can keep on talking about that forever. Me too. Um, But I'm going to transition to. My next question that I'd love to ask everybody, what are you reading right now? Your great writers are readers. You have quoted a million books that I have never (laughs) read, and now we'll go and read. What are you reading right now? Um, What I'm reading right now is I always have like six books in my bag, which is a problem. Yeah, that's me too. But the thing that I'm really reading is Foreign Policy, no, Foreign Affairs Magazine, uh, 
did a whole magazine uh, dedicated to the issue of inequality. Hmm. And I think inequality is more dire than racism because sometimes it it parades as racism, but it's really inequality. Sometimes it parades as uh, sexism, but it's really inequality. And I think that like, and so it's all these experts from around the world talking about it. And it's like, I'm like a happy adventure outdoorsy kind of guy, but like I'll be by the campfire, you know, reading about international monetary policy because I'm just interested in the way the world works. And I just want to understand, you know, and it's this huge issue, you know, is so it feels so big. And sometimes I feel like I have no business trying to understand it, but I might as well try. So I've been, I've been like sludging through this like fascinating conversation and I love it. I'm just like, Wow, we got to get we got It's amazing to see how far we've come. I mean, we feel like we're in a pretty sticky situation right now, which we are. But it's so funny when people talk about the good old days like, "Ah, oh, life was better in the 50s." It's like, "Well, if you were white, you know, maybe it was." But like pretty much any time in history was worse than it is now. Mhm. If you look at the statistics, like the world is in such a great place right now compared to the past compared to the past but yeah, i love we still have a long way to go right. but like that's the beauty of this idea of like the now and the not yet like yeah. there's so much beauty to be had and things uh you know things become more and more like this beautiful garden mm-hmm. but uh but yeah but we we're coming from somewhere else yeah so that's what i'm reading and just I'm always doing something like that. That's great. Just filling my that, brain up. That's something I've long <laughs> admired about you. And you can totally send that over when you're done. I, I love that, that you we have like known who I was since MySpace. It's it's kind of embarrassing. I, I just like... I, here's the thing. Was I, it Invisible Children? It was Invisible Children. Yeah. I probably had you in like my MySpace top eight at some point. Like Lies. You weren't number one or two. Definitely no, not. That I was for my middle school yet. girlfriends. But um, <laughs> but you you could have been seven or eight, you know. I feel good Just about trying that. to be cool. Like, I was trying to be cool, but you were up top there. Top eight was dark. <laughs> it was like war. Oh, man. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's that was always my trick is I would put... I would always have like my sister as my number one so that like right. everybody else is no just like, no yet. one gets number one and then there's no drama. And then I put like nonprofits and bands in there too. Yeah. And so I had like invisible children to write love in her Heck arms. Yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> and I probably had like Switchfoot in there, you know, some, oh, they're you so know, good. I feel like that John was like, Foreman the thing. is so good. John Foreman. So John Foreman is somebody I would love to have on the show because I've long admired the way that he looks at the world in a similar way he to the has way I to admire get, you. Honestly, he... Oh, thank you. That means a lot because I admire him so much. He is so special. Well, he was one of the first people that I admired for using his art to mm-hmm. make an impact in the world, but also just to change the way that people think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think of Donald Miller as another one of those yeah. people who his art that he created as a writer, like changed the foundations of who I am mm. at a young age. Yeah, you have really good taste. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had good taste on MySpace. All people <laughs> in my top eight. Tune in next time for <laughs> Brandon's... <laughs> next on his top eight, his sister. <laughs> um, okay, my final question is um, based on the ways you've chosen to step out and live differently based off of our conversation today, what's one thing you'd encourage someone else to do in their own life. Mm. This is very on brand for me, but whatever. I honestly think you need to go camping. Like get your crew, get your squad, find a Saturday night, go sit around a fire. Like the moment you get a warm weekend, go and just talk. And like, please go somewhere where your phones don't work. It is so recharging and so great and funny and fun. And those are the things, those are the memories where you will joke with your friends about that weekend the rest of the year. So you should probably do it every two months. You know, I just read a National Geographic. They have a a couple, maybe last month, it was about national parks. And one of the essays was called like Your Brain on Nature. And it talks about the three day rule. So we're all addicted. You know, anybody that has a smartphone is addicted to it. My phone is vibrating in my pocket right now. Yeah. 
And this is what I'm saying. So, it, you know, the, the obsession with information is a dopamine, whatever. And so it's the three-day rule that they found is if you digital detox for three days, if you go into nature on the third day, I believe, on the third day, you will forget, you will be so back dialed into your like raw senses that you'll forget what it's like to care. Hmm. Like the first day you'll feel the phantom vibrate on your pocket, even though you don't have your phone. And you're like, oh, I thought my, but you don't even have your phone. On the second day, you'll be like, oh my God, what emails are building up? Ugh. Then something happens and you will forget what it was like to care. So my Super Bowl is the Oscars. Like, I love artsy movies. I love actors. I love screenwriters. I love directors. And so on my bike trip, there was the Oscars happened when I was crossing from Panama into Colombia. And there's no road, so you have to take a sailboat. So I'm on a sailboat for five days th- through the Caribbean, bouncing from little abandoned island to the next. Insane. And it was during the Oscars. And I remember when I got on the boat, I was like, dang it. I'm not even I'm not even going to know. It'll be 2 days later and I won't even have known who won. I was so stressed. I am not joking. 3 days into that boat trip, by the 5th day I didn't even care that movies existed. I was like the Caribbean, the sand, the coconuts. We sliced a coconut with a machete and poured rum in there and it was like the best thing I've ever had. It's just like I was so present that I forgot what it was like to care about anything other than where I was. And I'm just like, everybody needs that reset once a year. But you can start with just go get outside for a weekend. Plan it now. Tell your friends. Honestly, it it's just such a stepping stone into like cultivating joy and that curiosity. Yeah. That's perfect. That what a <laughs> cool way to end the episode. This is man. I, what a privilege to be I'm, here. I'm, I'm so going to have you on like ten more times. It's going to become Done. the I Jedediah show. And <laughs> um, man, I'm I'm so glad we got to do this. Um, before people go on their camping trips, where can people follow along with what you're doing online? And then forget about you after three days. Exactly. Uh, just I mean, I my primary source of communicating with the world is Instagram. I just like how clean it is. And it's just my name, Jedediah Jenkins. Yeah. And that I just post. And warning, I post long captions. I mean, I do too. So people listening to this okay, good. are okay with long captions, I hope. Because I'm all about long captions. Really, yeah, it's like, if Instagram just got rid of pictures and I could just write long captions and people would still use it, I'd be fine yeah. with that. But I do love that like, there's a limit. It's like exactly like two good chunky paragraphs. And mm-hmm. I'm like, ain't nobody got more time than that. You know? So... And it's a great, so on there, I not only post what I'm doing, but also like ideas that I'm processing while I'm writing my book. So it kind of gives you a flavor of what I'm thinking about, writing about, processing. So if if you like that, you probably will like the book that's forthcoming. If you don't like it, then you don't have to follow me. And live your truth. I have no doubt that you will post about the book coming out on your Instagram yes. when it comes out. Mm. So that's great. And also Google Jedediah and read things he's written on the internet too because he's written a few great things about his journey and it's really cool thank you Jedediah thank you so much for being here um, <laughs> th- it's seriously been an honor I'm going to be processing through all of this for me too. a long time thank you for having me what a treat invite me back anytime I'll talk your ear off absolutely you've got it <laughs> I'll see you buddy ciao Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is produced by Gradient. Find out more at gradient.is. To keep up with me, I'm actually in New York right now and I'm about to head overseas. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. I'm sure I'll be sharing all about it. My username is at Brandon Harvey. That's Brandon with an E-N. And if you go to my website, brandonharvey.com, you can sign up for my weekly good newsletter where I highlight five of the most hopeful things that happened in the world this past week. I just have three more things. First of all, so many of you took a minute out of your day to leave kind reviews on iTunes. I read every single one of them. Thank you so, so much. Number two, make sure you hit subscribe. I found out this week that by subscribing, you actually get the podcast a few hours before it shows up anywhere else online, which is crazy. Number three, if you have a friend who likes podcasts, I bet you have one, 
that one that you always like talk to and you're like hey like what podcasts are you listening to just tell them about this one it would really mean a lot and we're only just getting started so lots of good stuff to come and that's it for this week's podcast i can't wait till next week when we'll be back to learn from another incredible person sound good yeah.